Ok, o streaming já está. Eu não estou a vê-lo. Ah, tem um delay de 30 segundos, pelo menos. Eu vou fazer admit all. Ok, vou fazer admit all. Sim. O streaming está a funcionar. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Teresa Magalhães, professor in the Nova National Public Health School. And uh, in the name of our director, Professor Carla Nunes and ours, uh, mine and uh, Professor Adalberto Campos Fernandes and uh, Miguel Pinho, uh, I give a warm, a warm welcome to you all. We have between, uh, uh, between us about uh, 150 or so uh, inscriptions. So we are we are expecting um, uh, uh, participants on this seminary, and a special work to our students of medicine in the specialization of public health, and to our special guests, Professor Eric Martins. And, and Miguel Pin, that uh, public health doctor and professor also in this school, that will conduct this session with, uh, with me. Just a few words about uh, our school. Um, the school, it's integrated in the Nova University of Lisbon. And for more than 50 years, we are a reference institution in postgraduate teaching, research, and creation of value for the society in the area of public health. Uh, with this um, seminary, uh, we want to boost the discussion on the digital public health. Um, it's without uh, any doubt um, a tool to create value uh, in health. And that's why we challenge uh, Professor Eric Martins, uh, a visionary, and uh, an innovator to give us a lecture about uh, how to bootstrap a country on digital health. Professor Eric Martins is a doctor and associate professor in health management and leadership at University of Beira Interior and at the ISCTE University Institute of Lisbon. He is also an independent consultant on digital health and professor in the former, um, a professor is also the former president of the shared service, services of health ministry. Giving now some instructions uh, of, uh, of the session, uh, we will have in the next 50 minutes or so, uh, the intervention of the professor Enrique Martins and after a discussion for more 40 minutes around about. For the construction of, of the panel, um, the discussion panel, we count on you all. And for that, uh, we want to, you to make the sub subscription on the Q&A &A, um, or BATPAP in, in Portuguese or in Brazilian. <laughs> Um, the first three people doing that, starting now, will have the word. Will, will have the word. I will give you the word for three minutes, uh, in the end of the, the lecture, and the rest can the, the, can write the questions also in the Q and A. That will be managed managed by me and uh, Miguel. I remember that uh, the session or the seminar will be held in English. So please, the interventions will be done in English, okay? So um, welcome, Professor. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. 
and thank you to the school for inviting me for this uh, conversation at the end of the afternoon uh, with everyone. And uh, I'll try to share my screen now with everyone. Let's see if all goes well on that. And uh, so I hope you can see that. Is that okay? You can okay. see my slides. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you again uh, for the for the kind invitation. The challenge uh, I think was quite interesting, uh, and it's very good when we are invited to to present about something that. Just try to. Still, okay, um, that that we like to talk about, and and uh, when you suggested bring on the digital health systems revolution, I added, uh, more than the digital revolution, because we are we are talking about health care systems. Um, and I looked at this topic, and I'm going to share this topic under um, these bullets. Uh, I'm going to share first a vision about how I see uh, healthcare systems evolving and how they should use digital tools to evolve. Um, this means new patients uh, new professionals and new ways of looking at organizations, what I call Kiwi organizations. Uh, I will then explore uh, how are we looking at artificial intelligence and robotics and, and how that is changing medical paradigms. Um, and when you combine these things, uh, a new vision about the system, patients, professionals and organizations, as well as the medical paradigm itself, you are forced to think that we, you need a new healthcare system. And to some extent, that brings you to what I call precision public health. Uh, then the last two topics are about how to actually build and create the conditions to really have a digital uh, health system that makes use of digital health. Um, and this means leadership and national strategies. So let's, let's get started. So first of all, let me share with you my vision about digital health systems. I think they will be preventive, paperless, empowering, personalized, and accountable. And this means that digital healthcare um, strengths lay not in technology, but rather that the digital technology will be present in processes, professionals, and people in such a way that everyone can be a healthcare creator. I suggest with this description that to some extent, successful healthcare systems are those that get a citizen up to the level that he can care for himself. He can create conditions for health. Um, so he will become a sort of a prevention specialist by caring for him or herself and his family with the best scientific support, access to digital therapeutics by default. And only by last resource should people be moved for what's called physical care, what we now call hospitals or primary care facilities. Even drug therapy and surgery are things that should come at a second level after digital interventions have been exhausted. And why is it now the moment to talk about digital healthcare systems. Well, first, we are observing healthcare transformation of both processes, professionals, and patients. Uh, but we also need a change in the care philosophy. We need interprofessional collaboration and health aware citizens. And this, this was already true before the pandemic. I think care philosophy now would agree professional collaboration and health aware now we would agree that uh, citizens are more health aware. At second, uh, significant investment in rethinking at any need for physical intervention. We need to think twice before asking patients to come to hospitals. Telehealth is the new health that we need to foster. A third tension and a third trend is securing of data, privacy, and interoperability. And Likewise, robotic professionals will step in where humans are at risk for intervention, are not enough, 
or where human and robot hybrids outperform both. And we have examples of this. This is not science fiction. Uh, we have situations uh, in isolation where we would have liked robots to have uh, uh, intervened rather than humans because they would have been at risk for uh, infectious diseases. Or the case of, for example, the Da Vinci robot where a human robot hybrid really outperforms humans alone in certain types of surgeries for uh, cancer, for example. And finally, the fourth motivation is to rethink healthcare systems worldwide. And why? This was already needed before 2020, but definitely 2020 has given us the extra motivation we need. So now look, what do we say when we say about new patients, professionals, and organizations? Let's start with patients. And we'll start with patients because in the overall parts of the system, professionals, hospitals, organizations, patients, citizens, patients are the, the factor that is changing the most in the last few years and will continue to change significantly and very rapidly as people are taking hands literally of their own health and using digital tools to manage their own health. And digital patient is a double-sided concept. And it's important to think like that. On one hand, digital patients are, of course, people that progressively are more connected. Sometimes they're connected for life, like with brain electrode implants, to digital technologies. Digital patients are us, me and you, increasingly using more and more digital tools to measure health, wellness. And even now with track apps for COVID, we are tracking the healthcare and the health of others around our physical proximity spaces. I would dare say that Bluetooth zone around our phone is likely to become our new digital skin as our uh, sensors expand from the normal skin, biological skin to digital skin, bring us a, as the awareness about our surroundings. But on the dark side, digital patients are also humans suffering from what I call as a physician internist, a new category of systemic diseases, digital sickness. And uh, I'm going to, to go more in depth into these dimensions. First, let me share with you a simple concept. Not everyone is 100% healthy. Not everyone is 100% sick in every day of their life. Even in the, the best of our days, there may be something wrong with us. And even in the most painful moment of our uh, patient journeys, we may have moments where we feel happy and joyful. So the fundamental important question is, what is the percentage of our healthy and unhealthy self every day? Could we measure this? And if we could measure this, could we then manage it? Because if you can't manage, uh, you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So this concept of health index uh, it can be used throughout your own lifetime because even at birth, we're not all birth uh, healthy. And even when we die, um, sometimes our organs, and if we have donated our organs, uh, they may go in a healthier or a healthy less state to their recipients throughout their lifetime. Of course, we rotate in many, many, many of these cycles of healthiness and unhealthiness. So how to calculate this index and how could we eventually use population digital health data to create the models? And this is the first contribution from public health. And this is the true word public health and not public diseases. Public health is how to measure the health of the population, not the diseases, the epidemiology of the diseases. So this is my first provocation for those of you coming from public health backgrounds. Make public health really health and not public disease. Uh, now, this means measuring health index for populations uh, and also measuring it throughout one's lifetime. So the total days of life times the average of your health index would give you your individual health index throughout your lifetime. And why is this important? Again, because digital powered patients are those that can measure their health. Now let's look at this concept and let's cross health index with digital exposure. 
So on the horizontal, you, you can see the percentage of time on the day that we are exposed to digital tools. Whereas on the vertical, you would see health index, positive or negative. So on, you can see that it is not healthy to be digitally excluded. People that are away from digital world suffer from too little digital exposure, may have digital segregation. Um, it is obvious today that people can, that cannot access portals or go to online tools have less access to digital literacy and health literacy. So to some extent, their health can be impacted by underutilization of digital tools. Now, as you continue to grow to your right, you will see health status going up to a certain point, which is the magic point. And, and of course, the question marks, the two question marks in the center of the picture represent an enigma. What is the digital time, possibly it is different from each one of us, that is best suited to give us the healthiest state of our lives? Now, when we cross that line, when we cross that point of digital exposure and we are exposed to too much digital, too much, we get what I call digital overweight or obesity. And this may be, you know, vision problems, tendinitis, irritation, information overload, burnout. These are symptoms and diseases. Um, when we cross the zero index, we get into the disease stage. Too much digital can also cause serious disease, like anorexia-related uh, uh, dis disorders, where I think I am different from my picture from Facebook, and I haven't updated my picture. So, so, but I think that is me, when actually my reality is very different from the one I depict in my digital persona. But also the dependency syndromes and other diseases, um, as I call digital, um, addiction and digital overdose. And also there are cases where digital accidents and death can occur. Traffic accidents uh, and isn't social rupture is happening now because of too much digital. Sometimes people are so distracted with their phone, they just have a car accident. And if you think this is not reality, well, actually look at the amount of publications that are already out there this is a, just a recent group of papers. I would like to thank Antonio Rodriguez, a fourth year medical student that has helped me compile this, this uh, slide. And in a, in a couple of days, literally, he found all this incredible literature that points toward the existence of digital illness in the forms of digital addiction, digital obesity, uh, and digital sickness in more general terms. Now let's look at the bright side, the good side of things. Well, technology is getting more embodied and ingrained in our bodies and brains. So initially, and if you see uh, the horizontal axis as body and personhood or brain and mind, and then you see on the vertical connectivity to digital, again, you see digital excluded citizens exist. But as we move from portals to AM apps to wearables and devices, we see digital getting more and more intrusive. First, it's about outside our body. Then it becomes inside our body in the form of devices and implantables, such as pacemakers or insulin pumps. And of course, we are now talking and seeing more and more discussions on micro robotics and cognitive nanobots. These are the forms of small, miniaturized robotic uh, digital tools that can be uh, used uh, in brains, according to some uh, researchers, and cognitive nanobots are yet not existent, but they are being conceived as uh, small particles that would be able to, to uh, clean up, for example, the accumulation of tau protein in our brains, preventing dementia. And then, in an almost science fiction kind of, uh, of discourse, you would see what's called artificial life. So when you cross 100% connectivity, uh, we are talking about the concepts of new connections and avatars. So people may no longer exist physically, but they will continue to exist in the way of an avatar 
that represents their posthuman personality. So we talk about mindware. So of course you're very familiar with hardware and software. Peopleware is the way people organize their lives around software. And userware is how that does this changes our life as users of software. And mindware is the capacity to hybridize software and the mind. Now, in conclusion, for digital patients, we can say that digital health is not just about doctors and hospitals and genomics and robotics and nanotechnology. It's about citizens and patients like us. Digital patients and digital citizens with health and disease daily equilibriums, which ideally we would like to measure so we could self-manage. Digital sickness exists and needs to be conceptualized, measured, and then of course prevented. And this is a new area for public health. It's preventive digital health. And finally, the, the ways of robotics and cognitive nanobots and avatar personhoods make us think that to some extent, the last frontier for humans and technology is what I call mindware. Now let's look at what's happening in that area of professionals and organizations. Digital transformation of medical and health education and health management is already happening and needs to be faster. And I say it needs to be faster because it needs to prepare our professionals and our organizations to deal with the reality of the technology. Digital professionals are those that work side by side with AI powered existence train increasingly in simulated and in silico environments and mingle with different professional tribes. Professionals and organizations will need to be what I call Kiwis. And what is a Kiwi organization? Well, Kiwi organization is an organization that is knowledgeable, intelligent, wise, and interoperable. Let's look at digital professionals first. First, get acquainted and get used to the concept of RoboDocs and other AI service, which will progressively anticipate triage and follow-up patients. We are already seeing nanobots and other uh, form, um, chatbots and other forms of bots in call centers entering into healthcare. New medicine and health professional schools are needed. Uh, they will need full-time, lifetime, electronic education records. I find it funny that we have we always asked for the uh, electronic health record. What about an electronic education record that follows from child to the day medical school terminates? Because there are, there are correlations between how we have been educated early years in our primary school and how well we perform in medical school, for example. And I've talked about simulation and synthetic data. Finally, medical schools need to have medicine degrees for AI robots. AI does not train by itself. It is trained, it is educated by data sets and algorithms. So medical schools need to prepare to train AI in health. Now let's see what is a Kiwi organization. It is knowledgeable, so it explores the highest degrees of science, technology, omics, and practical experience will still be required. Software like up-to-date or clinical pathway softwares, for example. But it, they have to be also intelligent using AI in basic medical procedures, like for example, the Da Vinci robot, imaging or genetics, or more sophisticated intelligent hospital management. Organizations need to be wise. This means trust and digital ethics need to be at the core competencies of organizational management. And finally, organizations need to be interoperable. They need to use IT interoperability, standards, big data spaces, and interprofessional teams and interorganizational virtual competence centers. So citizens will go through these organizations and come out as citizens at risk, or labeled as a patient, but also human resources will exit every day a health organization that is a Kiwi as a Kiwi digital professional. So a digital professional that is knowledgeable, intelligent, wise, and interoperable. Now let's look at AI. Well, AI has been around for many years. I always like these slides because they remind us that 
uh, artificial intelligence is not something new. It's been out there, tried and tried over and over, and it has evolved over time. It's not as if it has failed, just it hasn't been so quick as everyone expected. Um, and of course, these are for reference. I'm not going to cover the entire slides. This is just exemplars to show that for a long time, different researchers have tried to use AI in medicine. And when you look at these two sets, the first set of publications was looking at specific fields of AI and how they applied to medicine. And you see scattered papers around the years. But when you look at concentrated explicit areas in medicine, like imaging, uh, or others, you can see clearly that the utilization of AI in health has been increased in the last few years. And the Academy of Medicine Royal Colleges in the UK uh, last year published a very interesting report um, that's, that calls doctors to participate in this AI movement. Um, because if we want AI to be helpful to doctors, doctors need to participate in the construction of AI and not just to go away from it. Nicholson Price has written a very amazing paper. It's called Black Box Medicine. It was written for lawyers to know about AI in medicine. And he is one of the first authors to separate what's called explicit personalized medicine and implicit personalized medicine, what he calls black box medicine. And this brings me to the concept of medical paradigms. And I think you would agree with me that before Hippocrates, we have sort of a mystical medical paradigm. People would go to the witches. Then Hippocrates uh, was clearly the man that transitioned from a mystical to a more traditional, I would call medicine. It still wasn't scientific, but it was somehow predictable. And there was an effort to describe symptoms and signs. We enter scientific medicine, and now we are talking about explicit personalized medicine, which includes clinical pathways, where the algorithms, the AI algorithms are explainable and visualizable. But what we call implicit is what is AI based and to some extent, it's a black box. Now, if you plot these types of medicine or types of medical paradigms, which to some extent determine the paradigms of healthcare through time, you will see that um, through time and through data and computing power, you will see a very interesting trend. So up to the 20th, 19th century, you would have a sort of a mystic traditional uh, medicine based on human experience, musicians and physicians who take care of us. We entered scientific era with papers, guidelines, general drug indications and disorders or classes of patients, the born of the doctor as we know it today. But towards the end of the last century, beginning of this century, we started hearing about personalized medicine, precision drugs. We talked about rare diseases, and then we started to talk about specific individual patients. And I would like to name the doctors digital docs, because 2020, there are no docs that cannot be digital to some way. You know, paperless prescription, uh, electronic health records, it is almost impossible to practice without technology today. But this is very different from what we would call implicit personalized healthcare. Self-care based on algorithms, drug guided by AI analytics, and what I call the robodocs. So um, what does this mean for the system overall and for precision public health in general? First of all, we definitely are building up an intelligent national health system or service, depending on the country and what, whatever you want to call it. Data collection systems and users and all of these different stakeholders are involved. And when AI algorithms start to be used more profoundly, more profusely, you will see that we are building up intelligence in the system overall. What does that mean to move from big data to smart data? It, moves, it means we move to an intelligent health information systems that add value to clinical care. And we talk about precision medicine as population health based approach. So no longer we have to do a sample or study a sentinel patients when we can actually study the entire population. Primary health care, 
should focus and should also be expanded by precision prevention. So doing a specific prevention, specific vaccination programs for specific subgroups of patients, and not getting everyone vaccinated with the same vaccine. That is a very old fashioned way of solving the new problems of public health in the future. Trust, quality, efficiency, and innovation need to be the core values of an intelligent national health service. Without trust, we will have nothing. People will be afraid of technology, but yet will have to live with technology. And this creates a problem. This creates a tremendous tension between healthcare systems and the trust I can have on them. And, uh, and why are we building this? And I'll give you an example for precision public health. Um, I will give a focused example on COVID-19 and Portugal. Let's look at the Portuguese case. We have basis. We have unified, interconnected, three pillars of registries, patients, professionals, healthcare providers. We have a national electronic birth notifications. We have national death certification. We have a national epidemiological surveillance system. And we have central vaccination registry and vaccination records online and on the phone. At the EU level, we need to link up patient registries we need to have a European death certification system. And we, of course, need to link our national notification systems with the European Center of Disease Control, not via Excel files and asynchronous non-granular reporting, but with real-time messaging-based systems. And then EU-wide vaccination card or passport. This is the minimum to deal with COVID-19 if we are to make sure that everyone in Portugal is vaccinated or not, if that's our plan. And let's look what would it look like if we think about a digital health system or an intelligent NHS kind of response. Well, I will provoke may, many people in the audience perhaps, but this is an example. Why are we not tracing and tracking COVID-19 negative tested individuals? And why would we, we go about doing the negatives and not just the positives? Well, because the negative patients are the most likely ones to become positive again, because they were tested, because they perhaps were in a risky situation, they have risk jobs, or they have risk travel paths. They will have risk patients. They will be risk patients again, they will have risk jobs, and they will have risk paths either in transportation or home or, or in their social circles. And the funny thing is we have their data. Portugal, as well as many other countries, knows exactly who was tested negative. Where are they living? What is their disease? So we should focus on this population as well. And this is an example of when we think about precision public health and we think about a digital first healthcare system uh, makes us think in a different way. It's no longer just notifying positive cases and tracking positive cases. If you really want to solve the problem, you need to go after the negative cases, as well as, of course, the non-tested. This brings us to intelligence public health. So new public health, new health indicators are needed. Integrated approach, use all purposes, functional data, not just public health data. There is no public health data and other data. There is only health data, repositories that can be used to monitor administration and survey the system and not just different projects, projectorization, which is a very big problem. And this will bring you to early warning systems to outbreak detection. So emergencies need to be prepared right now and in advance. Why? Because population-based uh, public health information systems should be population-based. Geographically positioning is key. Most electronic records are agnostic of location. They were developed for hospitals. Hospitals don't tend to move around. Hospitals tend to stay in the same place where citizens, they move. So when you think about digital health as peoples moving around with digital tools, then you wanna know exactly where people are located not necessarily the name of the person, but what type of diseases or risks they have. 
and to conclude, and uh, I think, let me just check for time. Um, I have uh, another 10 minutes to go. I think I'll be, I'll be fine with time. Um, let me now use the, the remaining time to tell you how, how do I think we can build these digital health systems? Uh, and if this is a revolution or not, that's up for you to make a decision. I, I think it's just needed. If it's a revolution, then let's let's have a revolution. Uh, I wasn't the one naming the, the session. This set, the title was suggested to me by the school. So first, let me tell you, we need new types of leaders. We need what I call digital healthy leaders. What is a digital healthy leader? Is a leader that thinks digital in a good way. They are good for your health, and that of everybody health. Let's let's look at this in more detail. Digital leaders think digital. Every time they look at a problem, they think, would digital solutions help us? They think well and ethically. On data, they think about open data and what's called fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and researchable. Data is the new gold and information is sharing. If you don't share data, you don't build up information. But knowledge, which comes from extracting information and crossing information with theory, is a rare commodity. Knowledge is like jewelry. You build it on the top of gold, but you still need to find some precious, precious stones. And meta-knowledge is the network and the strategy, the design of the jewelry. So you can have a bunch of gold and a bunch of pearls, and that doesn't make you have nice jewelry. What makes a nice jewelry set is the way you organize, the way you strategize your information and your knowledge. Leaders that are good for you, they worry about human resources, motivation and change oriented organizations is their key preoccupation. They focus on developing workers and clients and they know that work can kill. Too much work can kill, but actually too much work can also be a killer of innovation. So it needs to be thought and managed. And then digital leaders worry about health of everybody else. So they develop organizations and they think of companies and organizations as health units. Why? Because people live and work many hours in their workplace. And of course, in 2020, we have already seen a lot of digital leadership. Uh, So-called chief digital officers have emerged the CIOs, chief information officers, CTO, chief technology officers. And all of these words mean managers of digital technologies that are of course aware of wearables, artificial intelligence, internet of things. And they are more and more using it in organizations. But in healthcare, we can still see a gap. Many healthcare organizations do not have a chief digital officer. They often, are not aware of the importance of digital channels and digital enable or omni-channel. For example, when we, when we moved from uh, um, Limit so 24 to uh, SNES 24, we moved to omni-channel approach, web, phone, and online. And this is very important, making, of course, use of cloud-based computer, APIs, and software as a service, or platforms as a service. And I would like to call your attention because one would think, okay, so much digital, where is the leader in the digital leadership part? Well, actually it's about the culture. If anything leaders need to worry in the digital era is about the people and the culture because the digital technologies, they will come into the organization sooner rather than later. So it's about a cultural shift focusing on talent and processes, looking at digital enabled organizations, looking at agile movements, uh, crossing functional barriers and empowering teams to deliver customer value in small and fast increments. And, cost and culture becomes a focus of attention. And digital leaders have already understood this. So they have understood that we need to move, like you can see in the graph, 
from tactical to strategic and from delivery to culture. And this is what positions organizations into a culture of strategic performance. And what is the future role of digital leaders? Well, it is to, to manage this complexity, and this rapid change in technology. And in the best way, I always say to manage digital um, fast paced technology is to adopt it and implement it as fast as you can. Because there's only way to keep up is to be on top of the game, to be on the main, on the main driver's seat, accelerating change, driving change. So uh, I invite all of you that may, may be leaders of healthcare organizations, do not be frightened by the words AI or robotics or VR, which is, stands for virtual reality. Just call these people, call academics and ask them, could you come and help us? Could you come and teach us? Because that is the best way to manage. The future is to build the future. So you can see when we took the, uh, this uh, uh, Japanese uh, small robot to a, a OVAR hospital in Portugal, um, and that's me over there in Japan learning about exoskeletons. The only way to manage the future is to be part of building the future. And that means three main components of digital leadership in the future. Even if you are an unnatural leader, you can learn. Leadership is not something you cannot learn. You can learn it. If you're not a natural born leader, you can still develop it. Look at digital organizations, think about people deeply, understand people and drive and integrate technology trends and you will slowly become a digital leader. And um, of course, at the macro level, this effort, of building a digital ecosystem, a digital health ecosystem does not happen with multiple hospitals trying their own little strategies or with uh, ministries of health having one strategy and the organizations having a different strategy. So you need a co something in the center. Uh, and I call this a digital health agency. And the four eyes of a health uh, uh, agency looking at digital health are information, integration, innovation, and intelligence. These are the four eyes for the new types of agencies. This is not a e-health agency. An e-health agency is not enough to drive digital health successful implementation. And to talk about implementation and uh, to, towards our conclusion, um, we need to think about national digital health strategies, the four dimensions. The first idea that I want to bring to you right now, is that when we talk about digital health, this is not just e-health, it is broader than e-health. Digital health is about people using digital technologies at home, very far away, from ministries of health or e-health agencies. So national digital health strategies should be organized in four dimensions, in my opinion. Our digital services, our digital patients, our health data, and keeping it ours and not someone else's. I'll explain each one of them in more detail right now. So first, let me remind you that digital health is much bigger than e-health. And e-health is itself bigger than telehealth. So when people talk about telehealth, they're not including everything that exists in digital health. And also telehealth before digital existed could be done. There are cases of telehealth being done with telephones. So you can think of telehealth even without digital technologies. Now, today's world, digital health is the basis of most telehealth applications. Likewise, e-health, there are components of e-health that to some extent are aliens to digital health. But when we talk about digital health, we're talking a much bigger scene 
We are talking about sensors, biotechnology. Um, we are talking about electronic uh, sensors uh, and, and, and other types of technologies that you don't naturally or normally think about when you think about traditional e-health services. So the first pillar of a solid national digital health strategy is actually a national EL strategy. So this seems redundant, but it's not. It should be always referred, if you're going to do your work in Europe, to the European scene, but also around the world, it is good to look at what people, at what people are doing in Europe and elsewhere to have a solid national strategy. You should look at a super national level. Then the second level is what I call digital patients, our digital patients. And you've heard me talk today about digital patients for a long time, because that is the distinguishing feature of digital health. So you need a strategy for the internet of health or the internet of things or healthy things. And this includes a strategy for M health, software as a medical device, and this is where you would find digital therapeutics. It's important to remember that in May this year, new European legislation, the medical devices regulation has come into force and software is considered a medical device as long as it has to do with prevention, promotion, diagnose, treatment, monitoring or follow-up of diseases. Now you tell me, of any sort of software in health that is not related to any one of these areas. And, and then I tell you that is not a medical device. All the rest are to some extent medical devices uh, and they will need to be think like, thought like that. And finally, what is your strategy? What is your national strategy for your patients to be digital powered patients? Not just patients that come to the clinic with a printed piece of paper with their blood glucose levels written on the hand by the hand or at best written on a computer and printed out of Excel. Third area of digital health strategies, health data. Health data space and governance strategy. Where is our data? How can we govern it? Quality of the data, who cares for the data? and who uses and exploits the value of this hidden gold and treasure, which is health data. And finally, keeping it yours. And I couldn't be in a better place. I'm doing this talk from the National Institute of Defense, where I've just presented a thesis on cybersecurity for health. Uh, that is why you see all these military guys behind me. Uh, but this is very important because if you build an entire castle of digital health, you need to secure your castle. Any cyber threat, any cyber attack can damage severely digital health. Therefore, this is as much a part of digital health strategy as it is an M health or to have good national telehealth center. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm open for questions right now or via email on my website uh, or directed to my email. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sending over to you, Teresa. So you forgot the mic. Professor Teresa? You're you're muted. Sorry. There you go. So thank you, Professor, for this excellent lecture. Uh, I pass the word to Miguel to, to moderate the session. Yes. So uh, following up on what Professor Teresa was saying in the beginning, we uh, were hoping for, uh, to have at the start of our discussion, uh, a little time for anyone that would like to step up and uh, do a short 
uh, panel discussion with, with a bigger question, let's say, um, and then we'll carry on to uh, the, the usual questions and answers uh, bit of, of the usual webinars. So if anyone would like to uh, take the floor for uh, a greater period of time than just to make one question, but to make a, a short comment, um, feel free to, to do so. Um, we already have Agustino Souza and uh, Maria João Vitorino said that she would for sure would like to, to make a question at the end of, of, um, of Professor Enrique's uh, talk. Uh, so uh, maybe we start with that and if anyone else would like to, um, uh, to also get the floor, just let us know in the chat box and we'll continue. So um, I'll start with uh, Agustinho. Can you take the floor? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, and thank you, Professor Enrique Martins, for, for this presentation. It's not every day that we see this level of detail and uh, expertise in terms of AI, uh, digital health. Uh, we have pleasure to meet in the past, and I think now is, is also the perfect time to raise some of the questions. Uh, since we are in the middle of a pandemic and uh, we have access to a huge number of data, and it's, it starts from times to times to raise questions on, on all the importance of data privacy and access to, to big databases. So I, I have two questions. The first is related with that data privacy and uh, the right to be forgotten, because it's we always talking about the connecting, connecting, connecting. And in this world that everything is connected, a lot of people want to disconnect. And that's my first question. How do we ensure the right to disconnect, not to be uh, connected with a, in big databases, sharing genetic information? How do we ensure that people have the right to, to kind of be forgotten in a, in a kind of sense? And the second, it's in this context of uh, public health emergency. There is uh, a lot of talks about access to information to do contact tracing in COVID. Um, but how do we ensure that institutions ensure that only professionals with proper credentials have access to sensitive data? And I am spe specifically worried about uh, uh, general professionals having access to sensitive clinical information from the patients, and they shouldn't have that clinic access to that clinical information. Uh, it's usually only physicians that should have access to like information if the patient is HIV positive or if they have any other kind of disease that can can be more sensitive. And a lot of the times in the process of contact tracing and putting that in the health records, although we are tracing COVID, there is the risk of putting that information in the, in the tracing. How do we ensure that the, we protect the, the data of the patients in order for them not to be seen by professionals without proper credentials? And those, those are the questions, thank you. Thank you, Agostinho. Professor Enrique, would you like to hear other questions or would you like to address this one first uh, and then uh, move on to others? Well, that's, you that's up to you, Miguel. That's up to you. How do you want to do it? That's up to you. You're the one knowing how many people want to participate. Okay, we have a couple of them. So we'll, we'll ask uh, Maria João Vitorino if she would like to take the floor. Good yeah. afternoon. Uh, my compliments to all uh, panelists uh, and participants. Uh, to a doutora uh, Teresa Magalhães, professor Henrique Martins. Uh, very nice to hear you and your perspectives. Um, I would like to um, comment or agree on uh, what you uh, said related to the fact that digital transformation is really uh, data driven and it's the new uh, gold uh, and um, uh, and so it plays an important uh, role in this uh, in this transformation. But um, we look to data uh, to find and search for 
opportunities for improvement. And uh, this is the, the process and it is a continuous uh, process. Uh, and that includes, as you mentioned, Professor Enrique Martins, the professionals and the organizations. Uh, and we now see uh, three generations in the labor uh, market. And uh, we are not all uh, Kiwi uh, professionals. And this is the challenge right now. Uh, so this is my, let's say, my comment from your uh, part of what you uh, presented. Uh, but my question is, how do you see the next steps for our Portuguese public system to progress in this uh, digital transformation uh, journey? And how do we have really a strategy? And I will then complement this question um, with a second one. Uh, uh, in your perspective, what could be the role of the private sector in this uh, national uh, digital transformation. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor Nafik, I think yeah. that there's already a couple of, of questions that you can uh, start to address. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank Go you ahead. very much, Miguel. So thank you, Agustin, for the questions. Uh, I think, let, let me try to explore a little bit that privacy. Um, well, first of all, I think the, one of the big issues that we face with uh, privacy concerns on health data is that people don't know how the health data works. Uh, and, and we need to build more um, glass around our organizations. Um, we need to allow citizens and even pressure groups and patient associations, but also common citizens to come and visit uh, um, where we take care of their data if we want them to trust. I think privacy and trust are very interconnected. Um, when you trust someone to a strong level, you trust them enough um, to give them information about something you want to keep private. So privacy and trust are interrelated concepts. Um, however, and interestingly, um, when you talk about the right to be forgotten, it's actually, it's interesting that people often, they, they don't necessarily want to be forgotten. They want to be left alone. And that is uh, an interesting concept that is worth analyzing. So sometimes when people choose to go to a big city, you know, to change their life because they want to be uh, somehow unknown, they want to be anonymous, they actually go to, to a big city like London or New York or Lisbon or somehow, and, and, and what are they searching for? They're not searching to be forgotten. They don't want to be forgotten in the middle of London or in the middle of, of, of New York. They want to be left alone. And this is a very important distinction. And what people want, I think, is something we need to ask them. We shouldn't create laws uh, today assuming people want this or that. We should create laws to allow them to express what they want in, in ways that are digitally possible. So today's technology allows you, for example, to ask the patient every time you access the record, do you authorize this person to access the record in real time? I mean, banks already do this for credit card transactions. Some credit card transactions uh, will not go through without you receiving an SMS and responding yes or no. And, and this could be done for an electronic health record. So even if a doctor is in the hospital accessing the record. Now, what is the difference between banking data and health data? Is that the, the, that citizen may not be good enough to answer the question. He may be unconscious, he may be dementia. So this needs to be solved, but this is solvable. And this is solvable by one simple concept that we finally have in Portugal, which is the status of the, the, um, the informal caregiver. You need to have a curator of your data. You need to have someone that is responsible for you or with you for your data, because there are many times in your lifetime where you cannot be in a position 
to manage your healthcare data. So these two concepts are important. And, and therefore, um, this is to say, who do we trust our data? First, who is the second person besides me to whom I trust my healthcare data? That is the first question citizens need to ask. And that's the first question the IT systems should be able to represent. So who is the tutor of my data is very important concept and our systems need to be, to be modified and changed to account for that. After you answer this one, then you can ask the question, do you really want to be forgotten or you just want to be left alone? And if you want to be forgotten, well, that's one topic. If you want to be left alone, you know what? We will ask your curator. We will ask the person that is uh, appointed by you to take care of your data, if we can use it for research, if you can use it for public health uh, purposes. Having said this and going into the public uh, um, uh, health issue of contact tracing, well, well, even in the regulations, in the EU regulations, GDPR, there are significant exceptions where the right to privacy is balanced off by the right to health. In this case, public health. What I say is that sometimes we don't even explain people what we are doing. We don't explain them why we need to know about contacts. And oftentimes we may be documenting details about the contacts that we actually don't need to detail. It is maybe interesting to know about someone's uh, person that was in the car with them, but that may not be the critical information. So this is, this is something that this is uh, seen in the law. It's called the, the principle of minimization. Uh, and the minimization principle is not an IT architectural uh, indication only. It is a practice indication. Doctors, nurses, and all other professionals should always judge one simple but very difficult question every time they ask for an information. Is this information really needed? Is it needed now? Can I ask it later? Because people don't just simply disappear. You know, many years ago, people would disappear. They would go to the clinic and then they would walk home. There would be no email, no phone, no one to contact them. People don't just disappear. That's not that easy anymore. It's actually increasingly difficult to disappear from the surface of the planet. Um, so you can always contact them again and ask them, hey, you know what? Now I need an extra bit of information. Uh, why do you need that information? Well, you know, we found out that the person with whom you were in the car actually has this disease. And it is important for us to know a little bit more about your, your story. And I, 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 you know, from my own practice, I have found that most times people are very, very, very wise. They are able to judge between privacy and health for their kind, for their family, for themselves, and even for third people that they don't even know. You only tell them, you know what, I need to know this about you so that someone else's life is not at risk. People just need explanation. I think we don't have enough time to explain, like we don't have enough time for this session to explain everything. Well, to Maria João Villarinho, thank you very, very much for your questions. Um, well, you mentioned about the three layers of professionals. Well, actually, I've always been uh, criticized by being very ambitious as I see doctors, for example, having to use digital technologies, even if they are 75. And there's one reason for this, and I, st I still believe in this. It's called continuous medical or health education. And somehow in Portugal and in many other countries, this is still not the norm. Healthcare professionals need to study all their lives. They need to be updated all their lives. And if they accept this fact for their speciality, orthopedic surgeons, they keep up, they read their books on orthopedics. They're, they are going to conferences to learn the latest surgical therapy uh, to apply to uh, a broken uh, limb. 
Therefore, digital enablement is critical. Digital enablement is part of medical education. I know that the Portuguese uh, Physician Association is looking, following from a conversation we had a few uh, months ago, is looking at doing something US has already done, which is called medical informatics competency. In the US, it's a medical speciality. If we had a competence, that wouldn't be too bad. Okay, and that would be something, of course, same goes for nursing, pharmacists and others. Final question, you mentioned about the public system and the private sector. I think the private sector is already showing us that I'm not talking about providers of care, uh, like large healthcare provider groups. They were very fast in adopting telehealth in the COVID crisis because they had a problem of interaction with their clients. Uh, I think private sector is always faster at adopting technology. That is no surprise, but I also have to say that the public sector needs to cater for 21% of Portuguese, which is not different from the rest of the world. If anything, it is a higher percentage, and I'm talking about digital excluded citizens. In Portugal and around the world, about one out of every five human beings have never accessed the internet. Of course, private sector can help on this as well. There is money to be made, so private sector can part uh, with public sector in joint ventures to radically change this digital poverty. And this digital poverty is a big problem because it will mean health inequalities. As we move to digital health, digital excluded people will become more and more excluded from care. Uh, so definitely there's a role for the public sector, there's a role for the private sector, and, and it's important for families also to think that if you're going to spend 1,000 euros buying an iPhone for your teenager, maybe you should buy you know, 100 euros of a good app, for example, for prevention of obesity in childhood, or pay a subscription to a good software that keeps you fit and eating well. So it doesn't have to be the government, even in NHS-based countries, to supply everything. This is not possible, it is not sustainable, uh, and we have seen that we cannot manage that level of care without the participation of families. So I always say, move from a normal scales to a digital scales. If you want to really measure your weight and weight loss, you know, with a digital scale, you measure 100 grams. With a normal scale, you measure one kilogram at a time. And this is the difference between non-digital health and digital health is more precise, therefore more accurate. Ready for more questions? Very well. Um, we have uh, about six questions that uh, that we would like to make you from different people that that ended up sharing it with us. I'll start with something that um, caters a bit to what you were talking right now, which was in terms of the different stakeholders. Um, you were very visionary in, in your approach as, as usual. Um, so one of the questions was uh, aimed at how do you manage it? And you, you have a lot of experience on, on this. Um, how do you keep this uh, revolution going with and without so much of the prioritization from the governmental um, and political uh, institutions and, and political stakeholders, because usually to that, you also have um, the, the, the financial resources that might be available in a greater or lesser extent. So how, how do you manage that? Because uh, in your experience uh, uh, in leading the SPMS, uh, you ended up uh, with, with times where um, digital was a very big priority and other times when it was not so much. So how how does one uh, cope with, with that level of uncertainty along the time um, and, and how to adapt and how, in a way, how to make it 
a priority to in, in the eyes of the political stakeholders and, and uh, the ones that can enable you to, to do things. Okay, very quick answer. I think, I think first of all, the strategies. Uh, I mentioned very briefly towards the end because I didn't want to be uh, spending too much time on that. It's maybe boring to talk about strategy uh, and why you need strategy. But you need strategies, three-year strategies, five-year strategies. In Sweden, uh, the, the Swedish EL strategy was written uh, with an eight-year landscape. So, I mean, it depends on the country. But anyway, the point being that it gives you a target and it gives you a time. And, and when you have a target and a large enough time, three to five years, this means that maybe in one of the years, you can go a little bit slow because you, you use the word priorities very well. I mean, of course, I believe digital should be top priority always, but I can accept that someone comes and tells them, you know what, this year, you know, we do have another two priorities to cater for. And of course, resources should follow priorities. Otherwise, why do you need priorities for? But anyway, having said this, then you know you're late. Because you've set the pace, you've set the target, you know you got late. And that is the advantage of having a strategy. You can then talk to partners, you can talk to industry, you can talk to political parties, even to opposition if need be, and say, you know what, we're getting late. We should be there and we are here. And this is what happens because we are late. We are losing money or we are losing healthcare opportunities or we are losing lives. One of the things that we need to do more on digital health is to measure economical, financial returns from these investments. Uh, and, and we need as many students wishing to do PhD thesis and master thesis, maybe in the School of Public Health, looking at the value of these interventions. Because we know from existing literature that there is value. We also know that oftentimes the value is not completely captured if the strategy is not used enough time, if a pilot is not scaled up, so studying these things is possibly uh, building up evidence to convince uh, decision makers. Finally, many times decisions are not rational. Many times decisions are emotional and many times politicians are emotional and they will follow the emotion of people. So if you can make a, a hype, if you can make fashion out of digital health, you know, like we've made with a paperless prescription, suddenly it became something everyone wanted to have. And uh, then this clearly justifies the investment. So um, I think definitely uh, uh, COVID, for example, has given excuses for telehealth, which is not total digital health. It's one small part, but the important part. We should not lose that one opportunity. That one we have, and we have it for the next six to eight months. Very well. Uh, we now have uh, Nunu Damparu, who wants to uh, put a question live. And uh, afterwards, we'll, we'll continue with also the questions that, that are popping up. So Nunu, up to you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Martins, for the presentation. It was uh, pretty enlightening, um, and I liked it a lot. Uh, I have a question about the, um, like the the, the specialization and also like the medical career, like um, how should it be adapted in order to like adapt these new technologies that are like uh, coming? And because the rhythm is uh, every single day going like faster and uh, the introduction of new technologies and new software and apps, and we don't know what will come after this, after the, the applications or this kind of software. How could that be adapted in the medical career and then in specialization? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Well, I think like all new specialities in medicine, uh, they start as an optional degree, as an optional course, then they become compulsory, then they become a sort of a fraction of a specialization or a competency, and then they become a specialized. I mean, anesthesia was born out of internal medicine, 
a pneumology out of internal medicine and so on. And why does this happen? Because the, the knowledge is so greatly expanding and the expertise is needed. And it's not as if we've invented the wheel. I mean, uh, informatics, which is a scientific field, is existing in the US for more than 20 years now. And medical informaticians, doctors that are trained to look at data, study information technologies and how it can help people have been around the US for many years. So we just, don't, we just have to copy the model. I know, for example, the American Medical Informatics Association was invited by the UK uh, um, uh, BMA, the, the British Medical Association, um, the GMC, sorry, the General Medical Council, uh, to study how to design speciality for, for British. So what we need to do in Portugal, however, uh, and in any country that wants to leapfrog, is we need to see the next step. And the next step is not that it is a speciality. Of course, you need that. You need to make sure Likewise, you make all medical students learn a little bit of anesthesia. You need to make sure all medical students know a little bit, not how to use the keyboard or a, an Excel file, but what is informatics? What is that science or that group of sciences? And then leapfrog. And leapfrog is to have what I call AI students. And what is an AI student is, is if you are able to train a human brain to diagnose, you should be able to train an artificial brain. And the challenge is not that you need to do it uh, because of course, uh, IBM uh, and other companies are developing their AI tools. The challenge is what happens to medical schools and medical education because you accept the concept of teaching an artificial brain. That's what makes the question so interesting. What type of teachers do you require? So you are asking, oh, well, how do you build a new speciality? Well, the question is, how do you change the faculty members? What new faculty do you need? You need new types of teachers, new types of professors in the medical schools and in schools of public health what I would call digital professors, okay? And this is a tripod combination. I have a paper that I wrote 10 years ago on this. I call it te tetra tetraedrum of medical education. And a good professor needs to be able, needs to be a good manager, a good leader, digital enabled, and then it has some clinical expertise or some management expertise or, or uh, economics expertise. So this, uh, this combination of knowledge is critical. These boundary spanner professors are highly needed. Thank you very much. Professor Eric, um, picking up on, on, you already talked about uh, active individuals and, and the owners of their own health and preventive health. Uh, you've talked about QE organizations now, specifically uh, uh, students, the academics. Uh, Margarida Aires was asking, uh, how do we have Kiwi citizens? Well, I think we have Kiwi citizens in two ways. First, a joke, which is Hello Kitty. I don't know if you have ever seen Hello Kitty. There's a movie of Hello Kitty with Kiwis. Uh, so that's one option. The second option to have Kiwi citizens is to, is to actually allow them to be Kiwi citizens. I think the first problem we have to, to face is to accept that citizens will know more about health, their health, than any individual professional. And, and actually, there's no surprise about that. You know, if you ask someone, do you know your house? They will say, yeah. And if you ask a plumber, do you know his house? The plumber would ask, oh, yeah, I know the, the pipes of the house. And then you ask the guy that painted the house, do you know his house? Yeah, I know the walls and the colors of the walls. Why is it so surprising that the person that knows more about their health is the citizen? Why do we keep thinking that the person that knows more about health is doctor? 
it's it's this completely stupid idea that we just need to accept it's not true. Once we go on that one, okay, that's the first barrier. The second barrier is education. Uh, when we talk about Kiwi, anything, we are talking about knowledge. And when we talk about knowledge, uh, we need to face one hard truth that people know, but they love to avoid, which is ignorance is a disease. Ignorance is, well, I wouldn't say a disease. It is a precondition. It creates a lot of diseases. And, and because many people in the audience are from public health, you know, I would like to see public health people really dedicated to fighting poverty. Because poverty is the basis of many, many, many diseases. And digital poverty is the basis of no kiwis, you know, just melons or watermelons, uh, you know. So, I mean, we get what we feed. If we plant kiwis, we will have kiwis. If we plant carrots, we will get carrots. Uh, it's time to look at our citizens and think, okay, you've exited my room. I'm a physician, I'm a nurse, but now, you know what? I've, I've analyzed that you're not using the internet. So you are going to our office next door, which is our digital enablement office. And there's a nurse there, or there's a, a digital therapist there to teach you how to use the um, NHS portal. And it's not because we want everyone to use the portal. It's because it's good for you. It's good for your health. If you don't know how to do it, we'll teach you. The same way we taught you how to lose weight, how to take up the pills, how to use an aerosol, how to uh, um, pinch with your insulin uh, needles. So if we spend so much money teaching patients how to inject insulin, why don't we spend half of that money and half of that time educating them on digital world? Uh, well, there's obvious answers for that, but one of them is that people thought there was no money to be made on that, but there is. There is a market for digital empowerment. And, and I think it's important for you to, to also realize that. And to, to perhaps build on your um, provocation in terms of public health, uh, we have one question that uh, deals with this uh, equilibrium between the individual and, and the public health perspective uh, from Bruno Brentz. He's asking, uh, who's the owner of the information uh, in the context of personalized care, which is you have like the individual interest and the privacy uh, versus the population uh, management, um, especially uh, from the, the interest of the society and of the community, such as uh, with the example of COVID. Well, I think, I think people love to talk about ownership uh, when they don't like the word sharing. Uh, it's important to know that data is a wonderful resource. Contrary to other resources that are finite, data is infinite. So you can give your data to 7 billion people and you still have it for yourself. The only thing closest to data on this is love. The more you give, the more you have, right? That's what they say. I don't know if it's true or not. So this, what, what people need to give is access they don't give away the data. They allow access to the data. This is the important concept. When you talk, for example, about data donation, the word is a, a nickname. The, the correct sentence should be data access donation. And this is very important because access is something you give and you can take away if misuse is being used. So if, if, if you give someone access to your house and they use it for good, then you're, you're happy about that. And actually the house doesn't stop to be yours. But if you give someone access to your house and he uses it for a misuse or drug dealing or from committing crimes, then of course you're not happy with it and you want him to stop. And this is the same thing with data. I believe most citizens in the world are happy to know that their data has been accessed to produce algorithms, analytics, public health analytics, 
precision public health solution tools to cater for health and to save people's lives. I am sure most people would enjoy the idea that their house has been used to help someone else. Very well. Um, and uh, uh, continue to building on, uh, on it. Um, Pedro Sobreiro made um, a question in, in the chat regarding um, the, the investment in terms of the smaller organizations and, and individuals, because usually, and, and you mentioned in terms of the private sector and, and also to some of the, the big organizations, he was uh, addressing how can smaller institutions and, and even entrepreneurs, I guess, also in, in that perspective and the startups, how can they um, make the best use possible of, of these solutions and the, and the, the opportunity of digital transition uh, without the, the resources and the very specialized teams that probably big conglomerates and, and private groups have. And uh, adding uh, to a, another question that we had in, in the chat, um, in what way uh, did you as leader of the SPMS uh, try to cater for that also to to bring the opportunity to more um, organizations to jump on the wagon and be part of the, the digital transition. Thank you very much for the question. Well, there's two there's two aspects to the answer. One is um, you need to create what I call roads uh, and spaces uh, that are opportunistic and positive for interaction. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, spaces where people meet, things like the EL Summit um, was criticized by many people as an initiative that was just a marketing initiative. Actually, it was somewhere where people met. People need spaces where they meet, they meet people with the same ideas or different ideas or complementary ideas and projects. Standards and interoperability is often dependent on governmental policies or multiple stakeholder agreements when you don't have a strong governmental uh, agency. Uh, and these uh, reduce what we call context costs. The costs of building a market, for example, or building a, a startup or, or, or trying out a project because they allow the interuse of technology. They allow building blocks to be reusable, open data, open software, all of these things uh, uh, are in a way related to this concept. So first of all, you need to create the conditions. And I think uh, that uh, still needs to be done. There's a lot of effort also from the European Commission in funding uh, initiatives that try to create uh, conditions, interoperability conditions and so on. Then having said this, uh, actually, uh, one sees that sometimes the cost of coming up with a small startup in a niche market is not that high. We see a lot of startups in Portugal, uh, in many in the M health uh, world, but now also in telehealth, telephysiotherapy. I met some of these companies very recently, now that I'm in this my new position and job. Um, and what I find is the scale up is the problem is not necessarily getting the first two clients that is the biggest problem, is how to scale up. Um, and, and that problem is, is not particular to Portugal. Many countries, even large countries, uh, face this problem. Um, why? Because people are very familiar with the big companies from the US. Uh, but every company, before they become big, they are small. The problem is we don't have a venture capital a venture capital culture, we are building it. Um, so investments are, uh, are critical. Uh, and I think the government, not health, but the Ministry of Economics um, is doing a digital transformation strategy. Um, and I think it's correct. It's correct to try to enlarge the, 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 the societal capacity. But having said this, for example, in Chile, uh, I have followed uh, another initiative where uh, actually some public money is put together with private money to uh, foster uh, some clusters of companies, um, not necessarily to sell to the government. And that's the thing we need to avoid, is to sell to other countries, 
or to private sector or to citizens themselves. Um, I always give this example. Mo many people spend half a thousand euros, 500 euros a year in mobile phones. You know, if only every Portuguese was to spend five euros a year, five euros a year in digital health technologies out of pocket as they go to the ice cream shop, out of pocket, they pay for an ice cream. We would have a market 50 million euros size. And to just give the perspective to everyone listening to us, 50 million euros is the double of the budget that has been has had to develop software and maintain software. Okay, just with a five euro uh, investment uh, for or usage. So it's 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 how do we convince people that actually digital health is not just a theoretical idea, is not just a very interesting thing to talk about on a seminar. It's actually about their life and how their lives can be better. Very well, we're reaching the, the time limit that, that we have here. So I'll, I'll um, motivate anyone that still have a, a question to, to do to put it in the chat as quickly as possible, or you might miss the opportunity to, to do it. Um, in the meantime, just a, a, another question, which is um, you of all people know how did we got here as, as a country in terms of digital health and, and many of the initiatives that took place in the last couple of years and what was needed for us to be here. Uh, so can you speak a bit to, to that and, and what words of advice and, and of wisdom you have for other digital leaders in their own institutions? Um, what hopes do you have for them uh, trying to keep on pushing for digital health and for digital transformation in, in their institutions? Fast, fast and fast. Do it as fast as possible, because uh, the fastest you do it, the fastest you will fail. And you will learn by doing and try again. Uh, we used to, to, to have an expression that called fail fast or agile. Uh, and agile is a methodology for technology. But because my middle name is Jill, I sometimes call it agile, um, uh, the ways of Jill like the codfish. Uh, so it's basically, uh, I think the only way to do digital transformation is to actually uh, not be afraid of it. Uh, many times people are more worried than they really need to be. Uh, and Portuguese, as well as other countries, uh, citizens, they adapt, they adapt. Uh, and, and most of them, they will adapt quite nicely. And then you just need to cater for those that cannot adapt so nicely. Uh, and that's where you need to focus the second part of your attention. So I think speed and then some energy towards laggards and making sure laggards don't speak for the majority. Uh, even in Rogers diffusion curve, laggards account for only 16% of the total population of people facing innovation. We should focus our attention on early adopters, early majority, and innovators. And of course, make sure the laggards don't stall, and don't sit on the way. Uh, and those would be my words of advice. Very well. Uh, we've reached our time. Uh, so I also just wanted to, to give the opportunity for the chance if there's anyone that came to this uh, seminar without knowing who you are and, and uh, ended up uh, seeing all, all these ideas and all these different um, innovative uh, ways of thinking, how can they um, continue to follow you and, and see what you're up to? Um, wh where are you active in terms of social media or like do your website? Um, uh, here's a, a bit of marketing uh, mm -hmm. time for well, you. That's very, that's, very, that's very simple. You just put uh, in my name, first name, second name, and then .eu, and you get to my website. So www.enriquemartins.eu, and that's my website, and there's a lot of more information there, uh, and it's easier to track. 
and all the social media links for LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter are there as well. Right. Actually, I'm the, the, the webmaster. So if you have any questions or any suggestions for the website itself, you can also feel free to send some suggestions over. And I'll tell myself to change the website next uh, day or two. Thank you so much for yep. this opportunity. It was a tremendous pleasure to participate in this seminar. Thank you, Teresa, for the invitation. Uh, and I also want to thank Professor Alberto that also um, was part of this organization and everyone else in the, in the, in the school. Thank you very much. Well, uh, it, uh, we would that thank you for, for this uh, uh, interesting and refreshing lecture and debate. Um, was said uh, that uh, we need an intelligent public health trust, quality, efficiency, innovation, uh, and also the need of uh, digital elder leaders and digital professors. <laughs> the academy can be a part of, uh, of this. Thank you for this um, vision also. This, is, um, this uh, seminar was one of our initiatives. Others would come. Um, please pay attention to our website. We will have um, freshly news soon uh, on digital public health team. Thank you, Professor. Thank you all. Have a good holiday and I see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you.